And let me briefly begin just to say a bit more about the OEBN. The OEBN is a, an open network for anyone interested in open access books, where they can ask questions, share information and knowledge about open access books, or to engage in discussions, or participate in events such as the one here today, and to help uh, find resources on open access books through this network. Then today, uh, we're delighted to welcome Eric Hellman. Eric is the president at the Free Ebook Foundation, which envisions a world where ebooks will be funded, distributed, and maintained for the benefit of all by coordinating the efforts and resources of many. The Free Ebook Foundation is responsible for programs such as Ungluid, free, program, free programming books, and works on Project Gutenberg. And the latter is which Eric will share more about with us today. And finally, I'd also like to add that Eric has been one of the most active OABN participants since we started out. So we're very happy to have him here today and to speak more about Project Gutenberg. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Eric. Uh, I believe you'll begin with a short presentation. So feel free to share your screen and take the mic. All right. So uh, I, I decided to title this presentation OGOA um, because uh, I, I, people may not be familiar with the, uh, the, the term OG. OG stands for original gangster, uh, comes from hip hop culture. Um, <clears throat> um, you could also say it stands for old guy. I no comment on that. Uh, but uh, the original gangster is, you know, the guy who was there before, you know, the, there was anything else. And in the context of, of uh, open access ebooks, uh, Project Gutenberg was started before there were ebooks. It started before there was open access, before that concept came into our collective minds. Uh, and as a result, it's kind of different from the uh, open access world that we have now uh, in ways that I think, you know, we can learn about it. And also it's just hung around there for 50 years. And I think there are some interesting lessons uh, that if our projects <clears throat> last for anything approaching that, uh, it's dealing with problems that uh, we all hope to, be dealing with in 20 years. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, uh, the first ebook, the ebook as we know it today, uh, was posted on July 4th, uh, 1971 by Michael Hart. Uh, interestingly, um, he was a, a freshman in college, uh, had been given access to uh, the brand new network, ARPANET, and he figured, you know, what am I gonna do with this? This is really cool. Uh, and the story is that uh, he went to the supermarket that day and on, the, on the, the supermarket, on the back of their flyer had printed the uh, Declaration of Independence. And uh, so he took that home and decided he would type it in on his terminal and uh, uh, you know, save it in his account um, and let people know that uh, if they wanted their own copy of the text of the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, they, they, they could get it from, from his account at University of Illinois. Um, so the whole concept of open access didn't exist because, I mean, well, you could you can give out flyers at the at the at the supermarket, but that's not open access, uh, and and you know there was no mechanism for it not to be open access. Really, you know there there was no commerce or anything. The idea of like paying for like bits was kind of ridiculous. Uh, so the concept of open access wasn't even needed back then. All right. So this is what it look, look, still looks like. Um, 
And it's, it's important to think about what the internet was at that time. ARPANET was brand new, and just sort of been declared operational in 1971. Uh, FTP, the protocol for transferring files, was only three months old. And um, uh, so e-text number one was Declaration of Independence. And um, you know, just sort of typed in. Uh, there was no process. There was no nothing. Um, and it was called an e-text. Michael Art called it an e-text because you know, it wasn't a book, obviously. It was just a text that, you know, was, was worth memorializing in bits. Uh, so looking at Project Gutenberg today, uh, there are uh, almost 70,000 e-texts. Uh, call them e-texts because maybe 68,000 of them are, you know, what we would call books or ebooks and then there are a bunch of other things that that aren't really ebooks but they're 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 there and you can get them uh what's amazing is that they are adding 200 about 200 books per month and they've done really well during pandemic because a lot of people had a lot of spare time on their hands and thought they ought to do something useful with it um the website is delivering about 5 million uh, downloads per month. Uh, and most of the collection is uh, public domain in the United States, mostly. There is a small number of Creative Commons licensed books uh, and uh, a small, a very small number of books uh, that were um, permission to distribute was given to Project Gutenberg and they're still copyrighted. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the th questions that, that struck me as being interesting are number one, how did Project Gutenberg get here? And number two, how has it managed to survive this long? So it, um, just a little bit of a history lesson. Um, the first, say, 10 years of Project Gutenberg was mostly Michael Hart typing. Um, the internet uh, enabled other people to, to help out and contribute. Um, and uh, it, it's hard to imagine these days, but um, there was a real issue with the amount of memory available. Um, and uh, so it, it, it took 10 years to type in the whole Bible and uh, or 15 years. And uh, the resulting e-text uh, was five megabytes. Now, I remember having a, a, a 10 megabyte hard drive on my Mac or like the office Mac in, uh, you know, 85, 86. And five megabytes seemed like a lot, but you know, that's how much space, uh, so, so the amount of text that texts that Project Gutenberg could have was really limited by the available storage space. Um, uh, magnetic disks came along, floppy disks came along and um, things rapidly changed. Um, the, the other thing that you know changed was was the internet. Um, and this was before the web or anything. Um, but uh, I've seen the the figure that sort of in the late 90s there were you know, maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand people who had access uh, to the internet. And you know, some small fraction of them thought it was a cool idea to to have these texts, you know, the Bible, Shakespeare, uh, the Constitution, things like that, available so anyone could download it. <clears throat> and the you know the technology available was FTP, uh, uh, mailing lists, um, uh, discussion boards, um, and there was a lot of discussion apparently. Um, in 
when the web came along, um, uh, things really sort of blew up. Um, the uh, Project Gutenberg uh, established a website in 1994. It was pretty early. And this is what it looks, This I've reproduced what it looked like in 1997, which is uh, the earliest that uh, Internet Archive has it um, in their, their memory. Um, Project Gutenberg, for a long time, um, mostly because of um, Michael Hart, uh, they really stuck to the idea of plain vanilla texts, that is just text. No, there was a long time, long period when they resisted uh, the use of HTML or anything, you know, fancy like that, uh, because it was perceived as as not something that would would last, not something that that you could just have as a text and not constantly maintain. And it, it's kind of true. They also, uh, you know, the 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 things that they could have done. Um, they did a lot of things and it sort of seemed like it was uh, throwing stuff against the wall to see what stuck. Uh, they did things like uh, posting, you know, a million digits of pi, or I don't know how many digits of pi. Uh, they, they posted the human, human genome. They posted the photos from NASA. And if you think about this, uh, this is what we call today open data. Um, and uh, you, you can see the seeds of it happening at Project Gutenberg. Um, they had this project called Pretext, which you can say is the, the beginning of, of self-publishing. Um, but uh, that, that didn't really prove to be a good direction for Project Gutenberg. One of the worst things they tried was computer-generated spoken text, um, to, which, if you think about it, <clears throat> uh, you, we don't need that anymore today. And so these are today sort of historical artifacts. And the worst thing is that they're copyrighted, so you don't really have the right to do anything with them. Um, uh, but there is the beginning of uh, audiobooks. So let's talk about what's stuck to the wall. Um, uh, the uh, transition was eventually made to HTML, HTML books, books as web pages. Um, there were uh, file types that emerged, <clears throat> EPUB and Mobi, uh, that are still in, in use today. And um, instead of typing things in, um, the, uh, the site moved towards uh, using OCR and uh, then proofreading it. Um, this gave rise in the early, I think, 2020, 2002 or 2003, I don't remember which, um, creation of an organization called Distributed Proofreaders. Um, we don't hear as much about distributed proofreaders, but that's really the engine that powers the expansion of P Project Gutenberg today. Um, it's basically a lot of people who like proofreading. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you'd be surprised, you know, how many there are and uh, the activity going on. Uh, I pulled this uh, screenshot from uh, the site uh, yesterday. I had, you know, 465 active proofwriters, proofreaders working in the past 24 hours. So, you know, there are, you know, thousands of people um, who have done proofreading for Project Gutenberg, which is pretty interesting. So thinking about why it stuck around, you know, why it's still there and it's still working today is in one word, it's process. Um, this is the diagram of the, pro of the distributed proofreaders process. So you, you see P1, P2, P3, those are rounds of proofreading because like it gets harder to proofread if somebody has proofread out 
90% of the mistakes, and then you have to find, you know, the, another 90%. And by three rounds of proofreading, it's pretty good. Two rounds of, of formatting, then pro, post-processing, a smooth reading round, <clears throat> post-processing verification, and then it gets sent over to Project Gutenberg. And on the Project Gutenberg side, there's a process for called uh, whitewashing and you know applying the uh, the header and the footer and making ebook files out of it all of this process was well established um you know by someone who professionally you know does does process engineering uh yeah so there are a couple of things i wanted to mention that that struck me as as you know, differences between the way Project Gutenberg does open access ebooks than almost anyone else. Uh, first of all, licensing. Um, well, licensing? What licensing? Uh, PG or Project Gutenberg doesn't license the content at all. I mean, it's public domain and it's against the ethos of Project Gutenberg to, to apply any license to the text. It's still public domain, even after it's proofread. That's consistent with US copyright law, but it's also, it's, it's also an ethic that pervades Project Gutenberg and distributed proofreaders. So as a result, you can do anything you want with the books. No asking for permission or anything. However, they have a trademark license. Uh, there is a trademark that is opened by, owned by a special purpose entity called Project Gutenberg Trademark LLC, uh, which actually owns the trademark. And it's and um, the, the purpose of this trademark license is to prevent people from making any money off of anything labeled Project Gutenberg. So what they try to protect is not the content, it is the reputation of the organization. And if you think about this, this is exactly opposite of what most of the open access world uses today, uh, CC BY or some other CC license, which basically says you can do anything you want if you give us credit. Project Gutenberg says you can do anything you want as long as you don't give us credit. <laughs> So it's it's kind of crazy, but um, you know this this licensing regime has led to an incredible amount of innovation. Practically every innovative company that has done anything with books has started with Project Gutenberg stuff that they've just taken from Project Gutenberg. Um, so um, you can't be you can't blame Project Gutenberg for what's been done with Project Gutenberg stuff by any of the other places that have you know, taken, taken Project Gutenberg stuff, done stuff with it, uh, and gone on to, to make uh, successful businesses. Not everyone likes it, but that's, that's the way it is. So business model. In the open access world, you hear a lot of talk about what's your business model? What's your sustainability model? Well, the OG don't need no business model. <clears throat> Project Gutenberg, there's nothing to buy. No accounts, no memberships, no logins, no advertising, no user tracking, no data retention. They really delete all their log files every month. Um, so, you know, doing you know, studies on usage. Well, I showed you the graph and that's what they do. Uh, they do accept donations, however. Um, PayPal's right at the top of their uh, of their header. Their annual revenue uh, is usually around 60 to $80,000 per year. Uh, that's about a 10th of a cent per book downloaded. Uh, they've gotten an occasional a uh, grant to help them, you know, work on their technology and stuff. Um, but mostly, you know, that that's that's the money that they run on. Uh, the only employee of 
uh, Project Gutenberg is their accountant who was part-time. Um, they get server space and bandwidth and IT support from iBiblio uh, at the University of North Carolina. Um, so, and, you know, if they were to buy it, they could, they, they, you know, from one of the cloud providers, it wouldn't be that much. Uh, one thing that Project Gutenberg really pays a lot of attention to is uh, copyright law. And that's because um, they work primarily now in, uh, in public domain books and public domain, it can be very complicated. Uh, so Project Gutenberg has a very elaborate process to, to do copyright clearance for every book. They don't take shortcuts. They have real experts, real lawyers. However, uh, Project Gutenberg takes the point of view that it is a United States entity. It obeys US copyright law. And if one of the other 200 or so copyright regimes in the world have a different opinion, Project Gutenberg is not going to pay much attention to it. Now, however, there have been legal actions in other countries. Germany, Italy, going on Santa's list, and you ain't getting nothing. <laughs> That's from The Sopranos. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, in Germany, uh, Holtzbrink, uh, part, uh, part, one of the owners of uh, Sprinter Nature, uh, they uh, sued Project Gutenberg because there were six um, uh, books that are um, under copyright in Germany, but not in the US. They are public domain in the US. So these you know, German books you know, uh, belong to all of us in the United States, but if you're in Germany, tough luck. Um, they filed suit and uh, Project Gutenberg had to uh, cut off the country of Germany from their website. Uh, more recently, Italy, um, some judge uh, ordered um, internet service providers in Italy to, to uh, remove Project Gutenberg from their DNS um, uh, because, you know, they had a list of like uh, 40 um, pirate book sites and they weren't smart enough to know that Project Gutenberg was not a pirate book site. Anyway, that's Italy. So just a, a little bit of discussion about sustainability. Uh, an OG is nothing without a crew. Um, in my opinion, the reason, the overwhelming reason why Project Gutenberg is still around is because of a large community of volunteers, a much larger community of readers and users and, um, who care about Project Gutenberg and you know, help, it, uh, help it continue. <clears throat> and uh, you know, the, the, it's sort of my journey towards uh, uh, working on Project Gutenberg uh, results from uh, when I, I uh, got frustrated with some Project Gutenberg titles, and I thought I could do a better job of making eBooks out of them. Um, so I did that and I put it on GitHub. I thought, oh, it'd be cool to like, you know, put all of Project Gutenberg on GitHub. And, you know, when I got to my 10th book, I discovered some other guy had already done 20,000 of them. <laughs> Uh, so I joined up with him and, and uh, together we started the Free Ebook Foundation. Um, uh, and in the course of that, I became the um, world's expert on the, the uh, software that Project Gutenberg uses uh, to um, make their ebooks. And that sort of got me into helping them out and maintaining it. Um, so the other thing I'd like to mention is um, 
about sustainability is that that any old organization um, develops processes and technology that get old and need to be maintained. Uh, technology needs care and feeding. Uh, something that works 10 years ago might not work today because software continually improves. So there is an amount of, of things that, that, um, that need continual work and that kind of thing needs to be budgeted for. Um, oftentimes in an organization, um, things are not well documented. Um, and you have things that, that you know, are essential to working that nobody in the organization understands. Um, so that, that's, that's a, a sustainability issue for, for all sorts of organizations. And you know, the world changes. I have pictures of my almost 100 year old house and um, you know, we had to upgrade it, fix some things that were rotting, uh, put solar panels on the roof because the technology changes. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that a lot of the sustainability work in terms of technology would have been impossible if everything hadn't been open source. Um, open source, Technology seems to me to, to be essential for long-term sustainability. Oops. There. Oops. There. Yeah, and uh, there's a great book about um, dealing with legacy software. It's called Kill It With Fire. Uh, it advocates not killing it with fire. It was by Marianne Bellotti. And uh, I highly recommend this book. Um, it's common that nobody knows how anything works. And, uh, and uh, you have processes and, and things that you have to figure out. And it takes a certain um, set of skills and demeanor to, to do this work because it's kind of like archaeology. And you really have to restrain yourself from replacing everything. Um, but that's what I've been doing for the last uh, two or three years. Um, and I'm happy to say that as of about a month ago, uh, everything at Project Gutenberg is available in Unicode, HTML5, and EPUB3. And there has a lot of work to, when you're working with uh, a corpus of 70,000 books, um, there's always going to be some strange thing that breaks something that you do, um, but you know. So, so that that's that's what I've uh, been spending a lot of my time on the last time, couple of years, and um, and like it's nice to be able to say that that we did that. Whoops. My takeaways. So my takeaways. Um, sustainability for open access means uh, building community, uh, creating durable processes, and uh, taking care of your home. Um, <clears throat> some It's kind of interesting. Sometimes those durable processes result in it taking a long time uh, to, to, to fix things. Um, you know the 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 uh, the saying that um, you know this is how we've always done it. Uh, that's reflective of a sustainable process, but it also slows things down, and you still have to work to to uh, remove the cruft and uh, keep things moving forward. So that's all I have to say, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Eric. The the sharing stopped, so that all worked. Um, and yeah, I think now we yeah, please for anyone who'd like to ask some questions or or comment or maybe share other experiences, 
please feel free to do so. I see we have a first raised hand from Katarina. Uh, please go ahead, Katarina. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Eric. That was really, really interesting. And uh, it's interesting listening to you talk about it as well. Um, so I suppose my question is, um, you did, you made some analogies to the current open access movement, obviously. And but what do you think, I mean, what, hmm, what do you think we could more learn more about, or, or perhaps uh, what good things about the Gutenberg project should we sort of uh, um, not miss out on in the open access movement, do you think? Are we, are we, is there anything that we're doing wrong or not as well as we should or could? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good question. I've tried to think about that. And, um, I, you know, the thing is that that um, Project Gutenberg, you know, arose in such a different time and created such a, you know, unique um, culture. But I think it's very hard to reproduce it in other open access uh, context, but I think, you know, creating the community, you know, on, on the, on the social, on the culture side, creating that community and, um, being attentive to what the community wants is, is the, uh, most important thing. If, you know, if, if you're running a university publisher, for example, um, thinking about, you know, who the books are for and thinking about what the role of the publisher, who the role of the publisher is serving and, 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 and doing that. And so it's not just about the book. It's about making sure everyone has the book, um, which is a different, a different task. There's a lot more marketing involved. Um, on the technical side, um, you know, I've, I've really have been able to see, number one, how important the documentation is, how important the processes are, and how important um, using open source is. Because otherwise, there's no way you would be able to figure out what things are, are, are actually doing by looking at them because you know uh, volunteers come and go uh, employees come and go uh, sustainability is about figuring out how to continue that on without having individuals being you know too much in control of anything Great, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, now that you, you described that the texts are being transformed from one um, thing to another, basically from plain ASCII to something else, um, I, I can imagine that there should be, how did you decide on what format to use to make it sure that it will be available in, I don't know, another 50 years? So right now, 90% uh, of the source files are uh, HTML. And the HTML is a varying quali quality, um, but the, the, the um, the main point is that all the HTML has to um, pass validation checks. Um, and the H HTML is a, 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 you know, a pretty good format for uh, being able to transform it in, into other formats. Um, one of the, the things that the ebook maker software uh, successfully did was to make HTML 
out of the plain text files that were, were sort of the original core of, of uh, Project Gutenberg. Uh, that transformation was probably much more difficult uh, than HTML to anything else. So basically, I, I know that some publishers have been working with things like XML and stuff. So basically, you've chosen a more simpler thing, or is that a bit too simple, or a bit of, of a simplification from my my side? Well, I think that that the format doesn't matter so much as the process that makes the format. Um, and, you know, if you can reproducibly do X and have a thousand different people working on it to sort of produce the same thing, you know, through some sort of process funnel, um, what you come out with um, reflects more the process than the particular format. Um, you know, you could today do the same thing with Markdown um, or other, other text formats. Um, but the ubiquity of HTML and the ubiquity of the expertise to work with HTML um, uh, makes that uh, a better format for Project Gutenberg than sort of more complicated or, you know, richer markup kinds of XML. Um, the richer markup, you know, it only it only works if you have people who uniformly apply it. And um, it's really hard to get people to to all think in the same way. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Who else? Should I look at the chat? John, did you want to go for it? Sure. Um, I remember one thing that was important early on and arguably was important up till now was that the distribution of the text was very widely distributed. I mean, there was a main site, but there were lots of mirrors. Um, there were CDs and DVDs that were distributed and, and, and so on. And up until recently, um, there were also regional blocks, which um, well, I think Germany recently, I think, Gutenberg possibly recently recently settled with Germany, and I'm not sure if Italy's block is still there. Um, so now now it's it's more feasible to sort of how all point to, to one place. But do you think the continuing some sort of you know distributed um, dissemination of this is is still important? And if so, what what should we be looking at for that for in, ensure longevity? Yeah, well, so that was part of the reason. I thought it was a, an interesting idea to put every book on GitHub. Um, and uh, the, uh, there are a number of, of downstream uh, channels from Project Gutenberg, which are important because, you know, they satisfy different people's needs. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's impossible to bottle up Project Gutenberg on one site um, and uh, you know have it be centralized. I mean it is centralized, but you know there's a lot of, of downstream modification that uh, happens. Uh, there's a group that you know is looking a lot like pro uh, distributed proofreaders in a way called uh, standard ebooks that, that uh, takes Project Gutenberg mostly uh, books and applies, you know, it's, it's uh, very opinionated formatting um, to those books to make them, you know, look nicer, to make the, the, the English more modern, uh, easier to consume, things like that. Um, I, I think, <laughs> That's a big strength of Project Gutenberg that you know there are all there are all these downstream uh, uses uses and distribution points, 
Uh, we had a, an interesting project I did with some students at Stevens Tech um, where uh, we helped another nonprofit called um, uh, uh, Kiwi, Kiwix. Um, and what they do is they put websites uh, into well, you know, self-contained archives that can be distributed on USB sticks uh, to places where they don't have internet. And um, so we help them um, refine their scripts that, you know, download all of Project Gutenberg, uh, distill them into, into uh, you know, these, you know, USB stickable archives and um, distribute them, you know, to places where, um, you know, the internet is not so good. Um, and that that you know that's a, a good example of 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 things that are possible because Project Gutenberg took the stance that you can do anything you want with it. They did it, and, you know, and you know, we've given them some help to do it better. Niels, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. It was really a great sort of tool back uh, to, um, well, 50 years ago. Um, I, um, I think it's really fascinating uh, how you work with this uh, distributed uh, network of proofreaders and um, considering that, uh, you know, thousands of people are engaging somehow in a systematic way in a process and that I could imagine that uh, onboarding people into this would sometimes cause, you know, issues where you'd like a help desk or something like that. So, I mean, how, how do you, Project Gutenberg organize all this and manage this without, you know, it becoming hugely complex and bureaucratic and uh, costly and, and so on. I think that it, it's really inspirational to see that it can work, but I, I was just curious if you could elaborate a bit more about uh, on that. Well, uh, distributed proofreaders is a separate organization. It sort of arose out of Project Gutenberg. You know, I think part of the original reason I wasn't there at the time, but I think part of the reason was that uh, a certain group of Project Gutenberg volunteers were sort of frustrated because Project Gutenberg didn't want to do a certain set of stuff. And so they went off and did, did that. And it worked really well. And, uh, you know, so that's now, you know, 90% of, of Project Gutenberg's new books come from distributed proofreaders. The way distributed proofreaders is organized is, is basically uh, uh, organized around um, uh, discussion boards uh, where people in the various stages of proofreading or, or formatting you know, get help from all the other people who are doing it. And, you know, those people come from all around the world. Um, uh, and, you know, so there's like a, you know, 24 hour uh, shift of people passing work around around the globe um, just to just to make the, you know, nice looking um, ebooks. Um, the, uh, the, the former um, executive director of uh, distributed proofreaders uh, happens to live in my town. Um, and she sort of retired from that and you know runs the local college women's book sale um, uh, these days. Um, but when I started getting uh, interested in Project Gutenberg, I had lunch with her and and uh, she, she, you know, was very pleased that I was, you know, starting to help out with Project Gutenberg. But what she told me that was that the one thing you can do that would make everybody at Project at Distributed Proofreaders happy is uh, make drop caps work. <laughs> so, like, you know, there are these people who spend a lot of time trying to make drop caps work. You know, because it makes it look like the original. I don't understand what you're talking about. So a drop cap 
is a you know the 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 first letter of a paragraph is rendered in some ornate or large size capital letter uh, and it drops down over the 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 paragraph you see it in a lot of you know old books it's not as common in in modern uh, typography but that's in, in english it's it's called a drop cap <laughs> anyway so that's one of the things with in epub 3 now it, it, we can start to see nice looking drop caps in in epub 3 Um, Eric, the description of the, the sort of distributed network of volunteers who are sort of united by kind of a process or a way of working reminds me a lot of um, Wikipedia. And I was wondering, are there any sort of formal links between Project Gutenberg and Wikipedia? Uh, I don't, I don't know of any formal links between Project Gutenberg and Wikipedia. There are a lot of similarities uh, in terms of uh, Wikipedia having elaborate processes uh, to, to, you know, result in, in you know, the, the, the product that they have. Uh, but the organizations are, ex are very different in terms of, of how much money <laughs> they take in. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is really rich, <laughs> and uh, Project Gutenberg uh, is really a, a, a shoestring operation. Do you think they face similar challenges, or do you think they're, they're sort of quite different, given those differences that you've outlined? Uh, well, I think one of the most difficult challenges for Project Gutenberg has been sort of evolving their technology, which is, you know, why I stepped in to, to have my organization help their organization uh, with, with uh, you know, maintaining and improving their technology. Uh, you know, the Wikimedia Foundation, you know, employs lots of engineers. <laughs> so they can, they can afford to, to, you know, the, the technology challenges that they have are are um, can be approached uh, with a more conventional kinds of or, kind of organizational structure. Um, then I also had a, a question, Eric. Um, and by the way, I very much appreciated the Sopranos reference. <laughs> That's quite funny. <laughs> Um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, a bit more about the future. So, um, yeah, having paved the way really for, for ebooks, um, what will the future look like or what could it look like for Project Gutenberg? Well, so the Kindle was a big inflection point sort of 15 years ago, right? Um, and um, in terms of the book format and uh, sort of the standards around that. Um, the, uh, right now, there's a lot of talk about, you know, where EPUB should go um, because there's a lot of things that, you know, EPUB does not do and it could do. Um, so I think one of, in the next five years or so, uh, we'll start to see, you know, the, the, the uh, a format that's basically, you know, the, the disconnected website um, that can live anywhere on its own. I mean, that's sort of what the, the books at Project Gutenberg already are. You can, copy that, that whole directory and it still works. Um, but that works because, you know, there are no, because it's very light on the, on the, there's basically no JavaScript. Um, um, they haven't really started making eBooks that include music or audio. Um, so I think the next 
sort of big change for Project Gutenberg will be driven by um, developing formats for uh, distributing content. Uh, and we might start even thinking of them as books, but thinking of them as, you know, some sort of more like an app uh, that, that lives on its own rather than <clears throat> an ebook. Uh, so, you know, that's what I see in, in terms of um, sort of, you know, the next 10 years on the technology side. Um, but on the public domain side, um, we're still in an, an era in the US where, you know, we can look at the date of publication and determine whether it's public domain. Um, in 10 years, that won't be true. In 10, 15, John probably has a better uh, viewpoint on this, but, um, <clears throat> um, you know, we're going to get into, um, you know, an era when we'll have to have detailed information on when people died to be able to say whether a uh, particular work is in the public domain or not. And that's gonna be a lot more difficult. So I don't know what's gonna happen, but it'll be a, an issue. Yeah, so John says, yeah, we need, it's 25 years when we'll have to do that. <clears throat> yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that too much. <laughs> so, so we have some time to, to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So for distribution in other countries, it's, it's useful to, to be thinking about it now. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, well, thanks everyone. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I think that th there aren't any more questions. So, so I'll, I'll let, let uh, Tom um, uh, yeah. finish. Sure, thanks Eric. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining and especially thank you Eric for sharing a bit more about Project Gutenberg and these uh, 50 years, these developments. A lot of new information for me um, and just nice to see how it has evolved and I'm sure uh, how it will continue to evolve also in the coming years. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Um, the recording for this event will be available soon uh, on our YouTube channel. And of course, please do get in touch with us or with Eric uh, afterwards if there are any other questions still. Um, and I